How's it going everybody? So, today I wanted to take a little bit of time and talk about how you can conquer anxiety. So if you've been watching my channel for years now, you'll know that I actually suffered from extreme anxiety for a number of years. Um, after I did some self-reflection, I actually realized I suffered from anxiety for a lot of my life. And I think the vast majority of people suffer varying degrees of anxiety to some extent. Um, my, I actually uh, was seeing a therapist for quite some time, uh, from about 2012 until about 2015, when I started to realize that the answers, I get better answers uh, in my own mind and in my own research than I ever could from any therapist. In fact, I felt I should be my therapist therapist. But anyway, um, I was seeing a therapist for a long time and uh, he diagnosed me with uh, generalized uh, anxiety disorder. And um, he said I had no reason to be anxious, basically. And he called it generalized free floating anxiety. Anyway, um, I was diagnosed with a anxiety disorder during that time, and a lot of people that know me now would find it hard to believe I was actually diagnosed with bipolar disorder and uh, um, ADHD, but more specifically bipolar, and also paranoid schizophrenia from uh, an early age, from the time I was uh, eight years old, which is very early to be diagnosed with these disorders. Um, and they treated me for that, uh, with that, for years um, and obviously over the years I actually learned how to uh, you could say manage my extreme mental mental disorders but I actually feel like I conquered <laughs> these issues obviously um, I don't seem to be suffering to a great degree um, for the most part anyway um, what I'm going to tell you all in this video is extremely important. Anybody who actually listens to this information and processes and absorbs this information and follows this information is more is most likely going to conquer their anxiety. And it should help with the majority of mental disorders as well. So um, most people that uh, you'll talk to about anxiety, for one, the general population has no clue what anxiety actually is. Uh, number two, the vast majority of people with anxiety don't actually understand what's actually going on in an anxiety disorder and their own condition. And number three, people who, uh, a lot of therapists and a lot of uh, psychiatrists and psychologists um, and medical doctors and therapists, a lot of these people don't even actually understand anxiety either. Um, they read a bunch of med uh, textbooks in school and they might uh, talk to some therapists themselves, they might do uh, internships and things, and might not actually understand what anxiety is, truthfully, okay? Other than like um, what they've read, basically. They know the theoretical rather than the practical. Uh, so, anxiety. What is anxiety really? It's very simple. Okay, and this is the bread and butter of what you need to conquer it, okay? So, anxiety simply is your brain perceiving something as a dangerous threat. That's literally what it is, okay? The best thing for anybody to learn about if they want to understand anxiety is the fight or flight mechanism that's literally gold right there okay it's fight or flight and essentially all the various manifestations and, and, and listen you may think that there's oh all these like complex uh, varieties of anxiety they're varying degrees of anxiety and some of them come from different places. There's physical anxiety, and then let's say there's mental anxiety. How about that? Physical anxiety is a chemical side, which can be, can definitely be uh, reversed through nutrition, herbs, and especially amino acids. And a great place um, to look 
if you're just starting on the chemical aspect of mental disorders would be the Ultramind Solution by Mark Hyman. Um, no book you read is going to be 100% good, okay? Every book has flaws, but I can say this book has nailed it, okay? It's, it's great and it'll work. Um, and you can look up the Ultramind Solution uh, companion book on the internet um, and by Mark Hyman. And he has a free PDF file, actually, that you can download for free that lists, has a questionnaire um, of all the different symptoms uh, that you might be experiencing and what the problem is. If it's a, t a dopamine deficiency, a serotonin deficiency, the actual uh, chemical markers of your problems okay, can be solved by filling out this questionnaire and then following the recommendations in the guide. Okay, um, but following and, and listen, listen, a general, a general approach to nutrition, like oh, I'm eating healthy, that's not good enough. Okay, you have to understand what specifically you're eating that could be that you could be intolerant to. You could have um, undiagnosed food allergies or gut problems that are caused by certain foods, especially things like grains and gluten, which is not a fad, by the way. It's actually, it's actually true. It's actually a, a scientific fact that many people, whether they're celiac or not, uh, can actually be reacting to grains. Uh, in fact, my girlfriend had fibromyalgia that was caused by gluten, and when she removed gluten, and also peanuts, um, when she removed it, her fibromyalgia completely vanished. And anytime she accidentally eats wheat, even a little bit of wheat from soy sauce, she gets fibromyalgia pains. Uh, even things like whiskey, which shouldn't really affect her, but if it's made from wheat, it will cause fibromyalgia. So anyway, I digress, and I hate that term. I digress. Nutrition, okay? GABA, GABA is a neurotransmitter that calms the brain down. Dopamine um, is, a com well, dopamine is a complete system that involves motivation, inspiration, uh, peace of mind and focus, let's say, but it basically makes you want to chase things or want to focus on one thing at a time. Okay, that's what dopamine deals with. Okay, different receptor sites and different uh, interactions with dopamine uh, do different things. So dopamine is not the pleasure chemical. It has it. It's it. It's the neurotransmitter pathway that deals with chasing and that deals with uh, pleasure and seeking pleasure all at the same time. When you have a dopamine imbalance, you definitely will experience anxiety and you will experience problems with attention span and focus. Um, an herb to look into would be Macuna perens or Velvet Bean. That works amazing. Um, but I have a whole other video on that. Um, but different herbs, okay? I have many videos on herbs for anxiety, okay? I don't need to go into GABA, serotonin, dopamine. I have plenty of videos on that, okay? But this is the chemical part. I would, I would say I'm estimating around 75% of people with anxiety. It really is a mental construct. It is a paradigm. It is the paradigm in which you live can cre create anxiety or it can conquer anxiety. And this goes for all um, mental imbalances, okay? All mental illness. It all has to do with your paradigm and it has to do with your approach to situations. Um, the other 25%, okay? And I'm just estimating, just trying to give you all an, an idea. The other 25% of people, it's probably chemical. It's, or it's probably chemical and mental. But most people have a very faulty approach to, to life and a faulty uh, approach to their mental game. Their mental game is not sharp. It's very dull. Um, and so I'll go deeper into that here in a bit. So it's very important to understand that just because um, a medical professional has diagnosed you with a anxiety disorder, it doesn't mean you need to take medication. Now, if medication is going to prevent you from, from ruining your life, okay, then go ahead. 
but uh, there's herbs that work way better and have no side effects unless they're combined with other medications or if you have other problems, okay? Um, and talk to your medical professional before you take any herbs or you do anything, okay? I'm just giving you all my opinions, so I cannot be held responsible for any crazy shit that might happen. Anyway, <laughs> um, if I could conquer anxiety and if I can conquer my mental demons that I was dealing with since I was a child, I guarantee you everyone else can. The difference between people who have conquered their issues and people who still take medication and suffer for prolonged periods of time is that the difference simply is I knew I could conquer this. And you'll see that is a reoccurring commonality throughout all diseases that can be conquered. Anyway, anxiety for most people is not a disease, even if it's chronic, okay? If you have, if you constantly approach anxiety the same way over and over again, you're going to constantly get the same result. Einstein said it best, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So if you want to change your anxiety, you got to change your approach to dealing with anxious situations. Okay? That's, that's gold right there. And the problem is... Most people, they're too attached to this paradigm, to this ideology. They're too attached to the, the label. They're too attached to the victimhood of like, oh, I have a, an anxiety disorder. <laughs> and, and really, the medical community, they all have, they, they have good intentions, obviously. Uh, I know plenty of medical professionals personally, and all they want to do is help people. The problem is they don't realize when you diagnose people with, oh, you have an anxiety disorder. Um, it's a chemical imbalance in your brain and usually they don't even understand what they're talking about when they say oh, it was a chemical imbalance in their brain um, it, it could be and it is and I'll explain more on that in a second But the problem is when you tell a patient that they start to identify with it and when a patient believes that it's all chemical and they have to take medications to 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 balance their chemical imbalance which is stupid you take an amphetamine to balance a chemical imbalance how many people do you know that take, uh, let's not even get go there, that's stupid. You want to balance your, your neurochemistry with an isolated neuro, uh, chemical neurotransmitter precursor, okay? It can help with the symptoms, but it's only going to make the problem way worse. You're actually going to cause a chemical imbalance that will deal with withdrawals, withdrawals when you remove this medication. It's, it's really stupid in my opinion, but it can help very severe, severe cases anyway. Um, again, I digress, goddammit. Fight or flight mechanism. All you got it, all most people have to do is identify the threat, okay? When you see a situation as a threat your brain wants to run away from the threat or it wants to neutralize the threat so for most people even the ones who think they have generalized anxiety okay when you what you want to do is stop trying to re stop resisting it like if you have a panic attack which I used to get them all the time it was fucking horrible um, actually, you know, if you want to make a distinction, you could call it an anxiety attack. It was an in, endogenous, okay? It was an endogenous uh, stimuli. Um, I was basically scared of having a panic attack, and that's very common, and it actually created this circle of panic attacks and sphere of panic attacks. When I started to realize I was actually causing my own panic attack, boom, it was fucking easy. When you realize, like, oh shit, like, by being afraid of having a panic attack, I'm actually causing one, now all of a sudden, the cycle can stop, because you're like, shit, all I gotta do is stop, stop worrying about having a panic attack, <laughs> and then I won't have one anymore. The problem is when you're stuck in, in, in anxiety, when you're stuck in that cycle, um, you it's hard to convince yourself that it's not gonna kill you. It's hard to convince yourself that a panic attack is nothing to fear. 
But uh, what I personally started to do is I literally started to, I, I, I started to enjoy panic attacks. And, um, you know, honestly, it's very hard for me to tell this to people because they think I'm crazy. And honestly, I just feel like it's a matter of having mental strength, the ability to adapt, right? The ability to, to, to change your approach. Instead of resisting the panic, you embrace the panic. Whoa, whoa, <laughs> because you think it's a threat, motherfucker. You think it's a threat. That's the entire problem in any anxiety issue is, oh my God, like my boss is gonna fire me if I'm late to work. I better get to work on time. And then you drive in a panic to work, right? Anxiety attack on the way to work. Like, oh shit, um, I gotta get this uh, paper done for school, right? I gotta get this exam done. I hope I do good on that test. I hope I get a good grade on my, on my, uh, my college course. Um, like the, the anticipation, the attachment to the outcome, the attachment to the outcome, the attachment to the outcome literally is fucking you in the ass. That's literally what anxiety is, bro. It's like, it's very amusing to me. Now that I'm on the other side, now that I've conquered my own anxiety, because damn, it was right there in front of my face. The thing is, it's so scary. Like, people allow themselves to get dominated by emotions rather than and it's hard to like dominate the emotions rather than being dominated by them. People have trouble, um, like you have to understand your emotions are not real. Like your anxiety um, comes from inside you. So uh, the other thing, and this is another thing, okay, so chemical imbalances, let's talk about that. Uh, people they don't, they, they're like, oh, um, I have a chemical imbalance in my brain. Well, what do you mean? Uh, it's a common belief that serotonin deficiency causes depression. What I found is when I supplement with serotonin uh, precursor amino acids, I actually start to get more depressed and lethargic over time. Uh, same thing goes for when I take herbs that boost serotonin and serotonogenic activity okay uh, things like rhodiola for example or uh, 5-HTP or tryptophan which by the way turkey and tryptophan that's a complete myth but I'll have to spell that some other time it's fucking stupid um, okay serotonin is big big uh, misconceptions of serotonin and its role in, in mental disorders unfortunately what about tyrosine Okay, how are they measuring the chemical imbalance? That's the thing. Oh, you have a chemical imbalance. Okay, uh, can you uh, can you can you take a blood sample, please? Can you take give me a blood test? Give me let's get some labs done. Can we see our serum tyrosine levels, which is just measuring? Uh, it's not measuring the the neurotransmitters in the nervous system or in the brain, or or uh, measuring the integrity of my receptors in which these neurotransmitters bind to is a theory. The reason why so many people go, go through the ringer in the, in the psychiatric mainstream medical community and, and, and just prolong suffering, they jump from medications to medications and some get kind of better, some don't ever get better, some get worse, you know. The reason why it's so wishy-washy is because the neurotransmitter theory is literally theoretical. Theoretical. Well, the approach they take is based on theories rather than observation, practical application, and trial and error. And what I did with myself was trial and error. Anyway, um, so it's hard to treat something, it's hard to treat neurotransmitters when you don't really know which neurotransmitters to treat. And most medications, uh, doctors and, and, and scientific studies actually haven't even found the mechanism of action, the specific neurotransmitters and receptor sites that these medications bind to. 
science hasn't even figured out uh, the majority of how these medications work, okay? S some of them do. Some of them have a lot of data behind it, but a lot of them don't, okay? And I myself was on mega doses of Seroquel for the majority of my life. I was on over uh, 1,200 milligrams of Seroquel. Anybody who understands uh, phar pharma pharmacology and or or deals with medications knows that's, that those are horse pills, especially since I was taking them from a young age. I was I think I started them when I was nine or ten, um, which I think actually you could deem irresponsible because those are horrible for your liver and your heart. Anyway. Um, some, a, lot, a lot of people don't know, here's another thing, um, so your external stimuli influences your endogenous neurochemical makeup, okay? Uh, we, we measure these things with brain waves, and brain waves might be the closest thing we can do to measuring the neurotransmitter activity um, based on brain waves and um, uh, God, I forgot what that test is where they hook up shock to your brain. Measuring your brain waves anyway, you can you can tell um, you can you can kind of like have an estimate. You can estimate the neurotransmitter balance, but it's not necessarily so much. But an example would be um, GABA. Uh, GABA can increase alpha waves, right? And it can activate, uh, it can actually calm down the activity of your uh, frontal lobe or your, your hypothalamus, the executive functioning of the brain. Uh, so exogenous stimuli can influence brain chemistry though, is where I'm getting, what I'm getting at. If I see an attractive woman, woman uh, my dopamine's gonna increase, and I know this because I start chasing. And my brain treats beautiful women similarly to um, how it would treat a delicious cup of coffee. Um, if I think about it, I want it. If I drink it, I enjoy it. If I am tempted by it and I don't have it, I'm, I could be a little disappointed and we know dopamine governs our food habits. That is an example of how an external stimuli can influence your brain chemistry. Uh, people who watch pornography, okay, people who are caught up in the addiction, the pornography addiction, they have a irregular loop of dopamine where throughout the day they, they have images in their head of pornography that makes them wanna watch it and whack off, okay? and they go in this endless cycle where they spend hours and hours um, masturbating to pornography. I personally had been there for years, it's horrible. And since 2014, I've actually worked and worked and worked on conquering that, it was horrible. Um, that influences dopamine, okay? Somebody who, who, who sits, actually there's been studies that show when you sit in the same environment for too long, your brain starts to go crazy, essentially. Depression rises when people stay in the same room for long periods of time. Um, uh, what else? Uh, the people can become depressed based on their environment. People can be happier based on their environment. Um, another thing, another exogenous uh, stimuli. How about uh, exercise? Exercise is technically, is it exogenous? Well, it's an, it's, a, it's an exogenous activity that produces endogenous neurotransmitters. Through exercise, I can boost my, uh, in, my endorphins, my dopamine, and uh, my feelings of well-being. What's another thing? What's another thing? Um, if somebody comes at me uh, with aggression and anger, it's going to boost cortisol on my body which is the stress hormone. And along with cortisol comes a cascade of uh, catecholamines like dopamine, norep norepinephrine and epinephrine or adrenaline and noradrenaline, you could call it as well. Uh, so obviously someone getting angry at me can influence my endogenous neurotransmitters, okay? 
And so the point that I'm trying to make is medication's not the answer. So somebody who wants to, uh, so anxiety is, t is an exogenous stimuli that excites or invokes a internal or an endogenous uh, neurotransmitter cascade response, okay? So the, and, and technically it is all endogenous, technically. So um, in the jungle or whatever, when you see a, you see a fucking tiger or some shit, or let's say you're going on a walk and a, and a fucking wild hog jumps up out of the bushes, you're gonna freak out and you're gonna wanna run the fuck away or climb a damn tree. And hopefully it'll save your life, otherwise you'll be poked to death by its, its teeth or whatever. Um, that's anxiety in a nutshell. The problem is if you constantly, when you think about the situation over and over again in your brain, it will keep the anxiety alive. So most people, they, they uh, replay the anxiety over and over again. They're dwelling on the anxiety. And the real problem is their visualization. Um, think about the law of attraction. Think of, and, and, and that's something that can really help people with anxiety. Whether you believe it or not, if you buy into the law of attraction, your anxiety will go away. Um, but um, people replay it over and over again. They're just like, they're dreading the stressor. So the way, the practical way that you can solve this is by uh, for one, you can you you can visualize the stressor in a positive way. You can call it positive reframe, where basically you see whatever it is you're scared of, like walking up to a girl or walking up to you know some attractive person, and you you know usually you might be scared that they're going to reject you or they're going to judge you or whatever. Um, visualize that interaction going well, and visualize it over every time that you start to you you see the images replaying in your head visualize that interaction going well and just reframe it and over time you'll start to feel differently you'll start to think differently the other thing is when you're anxious you're anxious you're you're attached to something in the future that's what anxiety really is no matter if you don't realize it yet you should really think about this all anxiety is is dreading the future it's afraid that something in the future might happen people have told me before in the comments it's no it's not all it doesn't have to be in the future it could be in the past well you probably haven't thought about this it's pretty damn simple pretty self-explanatory anxiety is always about the future um so the future hasn't happened yet. What creates the future is the present moment. So if you want the future to go well, create pos a positive situation in the present moment. It depends on what it is, obviously. But you don't know, like, w like let's say you're late to work, right? And you know for sure your boss is gonna chew you out. Well, you don't know what's gonna happen for sure. For all you know, your boss could, could have taken the day off or something. Um, maybe it's unlikely, but you don't know. And in the meantime, being anxious over it is not going to change the circumstance. But then when you get to work, let's say your boss is there and he chews you out, what if he does fire you? A amazing approach to this that you can take is developing the mindset that no matter what, you can survive. Okay? Like, oh God, I'm going to be late to work, blah, 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 I'm going to lose my job. Who fucking cares, brother? Or sister, or, what, or you know, whatever. Um... <laughs> you can easily get another job but but I have all these bills to pay and blah 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 like look motherfucker if you're already late to work there's really nothing you can fucking do okay um, really taking control of your mind taking control of your life taking the bull by the horns and enforcing this belief that I can deal with whatever the outcome is very powerful um, a lot of people with this that develop this mindset, what they find is, let's say their boss fires them or something, or they lose their house, or they lose their girlfriend. Well, then somehow life ends up bringing them an even better 
job or better relationship or better house. When you believe that you can do better or that when you believe that you're going to survive anyway, a lot of times your, um, your situation, like your life kind of like brings better situations anyway. And then you realize there's never a reason to be anxious in the first place. Um, but ultimately, most people need to face the threat. They need to face the threat. They need to uh, be okay with the threat and uh, you know, identify the threat and, by, and identify what you're scared of. What are you scared? What are you dreading? What, what, do you, what is it that's going to happen that you're so afraid of happening? And every time you find yourself in that situation and you feel that anxiety, allow yourself to feel that anxiety like when you start to be okay with being anxious it, it starts to go away <laughs> and really I had horrible panic attacks horrible panic attacks and when I and then I remember when I started feeling one coming on like originally originally I would I would be like I'd be like oh fuck it's gonna happen fuck call the ambulance fuck and I try to tell all my friends, and, and telling my friends didn't help because they didn't think it was a big deal. Um, it just made me worse. I was like, fuck, now I could die and no one will care. Uh, I had the ambulance come out and they did a bunch of tests. They said I was fine. They said it was just a panic attack. And I was like, fuck, no, there's something wrong with me. Um, eventually, I just said, you know what? Uh, I, I started to, when the panic attack would start to come on, I'd be like, all right, let's go. I'm fucking ready. I could beat you, panic attack. I'd be like jonesed up. And I literally pump myself up for it. I'd be like, fuck yeah, let's do it. And I'd be encouraging it sometimes. Uh, I think I even purposely tried to, to hyperventilate and try to create one one time because I wanted to face my fear. I was so determined to conquer it that I conquered it. And I noticed when I would anticipate the panic, when I would, when I would want the panic attack, it would, it would just go away. And then I'm like, what the fuck? Really? You're gonna disappoint me like that? And uh, boom, no more panic attacks. And I started to apply the same principle into everyday life. Um, days where I would be, um, you know, going to school, right? And I was late for a class. I wouldn't allow myself to be anxious. Worst case scenario is I get dropped from the class, which is a big deal. But generally, uh, I, ha I had a pretty strong grip on things. I knew that I could talk to the instructor and explain myself. Um, and, uh, or like assignments being done on time. Assignments are not going to get any better if you're anxious. In fact, your cognitive performance goes down significantly when you stress. So, um, it really just helps to keep a, an even-keeled mind no matter what. I mean, I see people driving on the road all the time in an anxious rage, and it just reminds me of how I used to be. And I notice accidents. It, I watch accidents, accident videos on YouTube to try to um, analyze the, like, what the fuck caused this? Was it anger? Was it, you know, how could they have prevented it? What, what's the psychological reasoning behind this person's actions? I always do that. And I find that most of the time it's a desperation to get to their destination on time, or it's anger, or it's just pure ignorance. And really, you could you could prevent so much of this anxiety by understanding that only bad things come out of it. Of course, you don't want to think that. What you really want to think is good things will come no matter what. And when you when you really you could you know delude yourself into thinking this and anxiety will go away, um, but then again you know more extreme cases are going to take a different approach. Um, some people re like most of the time you really just need to face that fear. You just need to embrace that fear. You need to feel it. Most people want to run away from it, and that's resistance only makes it stronger, and it's going to always be there. So. Anyway, this is the long version. I'm probably going to make a smaller version. Um, if you like this video, let me know. If you watch the entire thing without skipping or whatever, let me know in the comments. Give me your thoughts, your experience on anxiety. Let me know what you think. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Subscribe for more in-depth analysis like this, and I'll talk to you all next time.